jolly, and I'm not an MP. <laughs> I am wearing red socks. <laughs> Maybe wearing a conventional suit, but um, <laughs> time is running. I want to make three points, and I want particularly uh, not to build on my own experience as a conscientious objector, which I was, and indeed which changed my life, um, but uh, the UN perspectives uh, of alternatives to war and um, not just peace, but human security. And I was lucky enough when I was in the UN to uh, not merely to work uh, as the Deputy Director of UNICEF in many cases for children and stopping wars for children, even uh, briefly, so children could be immunized and so on and so forth. But I also took, uh, I was responsible for a while for the Human Development Report. And the Human Development Report, late in 1994, you can Google it if you want to, set out the perspectives of human security. And argued, as Michel was saying earlier on, we need a whole change, sorry, I thought you were saying that. Yeah, but we need a whole change of perspective from military means of securing country borders to all sorts of means of securing the human security, the security of people. And it's a broad perspective that covers everything from the risks of diseases coming into the country, cyber insecurities, uh, financial insecurities that lead to unemployment and, and disasters, but also individual human securities, guiding people and taking action against gender violence and so forth. And this was brilliantly set out in the Human Security Report of 1994, and there it was also a report, Human Security Now, by Amartya Sen, the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist who's written a lot on human development. The report was greatly supported by Oscar Arias, the president uh, then of Costa Rica. If I was giving a talk to students, dare I say, I would say at this point, how many countries in the world, like Costa Rica, have no army. Any advances? The answer is something like 23. Panama got rid of its army, and I could, in other situations, describe that process only in 1990. Costa Rica got rid of its army and built into its constitution no uh, army was allowed, 1948, and it survived. And the main difference is because it's not spending approaching 1% of resources on military like all the other countries in Central America. It spends them on health, education and so forth and the result is that Costa Rica's health and education is much better than any other country of Central America. Human security is what, and it fits very well, taxes for peace, not war, the negative, but peace and human security. The second thing I want to make uh, is the SDGs, the S uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which all the countries of the world, 993 I think it was, maybe slightly more or less, agreed only last September to follow the MDGs. I hope you all know, remember the Millennium Development Goals for improving health, reducing child mortality, getting girls in school, and that, 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 and considerably achieved. Well, the process of following that was a community, it was very much an involving process in countries around the world, to, including UK, to develop the Sustainable Development Goals. Goal 16 of that is to build uh, inclusive societies and peaceful, uh, and peaceful, sorry, inclusive and peaceful societies doesn't spell it out in much detail, but the whole process of the SDGs is one in which non-government groups are encouraged to contribute to defining what those goals mean in each country. A wonderful formal opening by the, by the UN 
for action. And finally, I want to just leave three uh, for statistics with you as an economist. You know we have to have statistics. But these are important, and I'm very pleased that I learned them initially from conscience when I came to a meeting about a year ago. And I looked them up, so check. If you take British expenditure on the military, and let's call it the military, not defence, it's the military, add aid, add soft power diplomacy, the BBC World Service, and those activities, you get to something like 45 to 50 billion pounds. 75% of that goes to old-fashioned hard power, the military. 23%, 23% goes to aid. Very high, very worthy. Only 2% goes to the diplomacy, the BBC, uh, ex World Service, the diplomatic service, and so forth. That is far, far too little. The proportion of those budgets as all wrong in relation to the human security threats and what Britain could do, and I think these people were saying, the leadership that Britain could give. And Sean told me this evening, there is a conflict security and stability fund, which is um, now one billion pounds a year. That's good, that's part of the two, just over two percent. If money is spent on Trident, that would be an extra two billion a year for 40 years. Again, totally shifting the proportions in the wrong direction, looking back to a past Cold War instead of looking forward to the sort of society there where human security is needed. And the sort of societies in the world, not just Britain's, where we can get, certainly reduce military, and we might even follow countries that have actually got rid of their armies. <laughs> Ambitious, but why not? <laughs> Thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating. One or two interesting ideas I think has come out of our discussion this evening. I was particularly keen on this idea of a Minister for Peace. Um, I think if Richard Jolly is looking for a job in the future, um, I'd certainly think he would be a shoe in for that one. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and of course, dare I say, Canada for several years had Doug Roach, Minister for Disarmament Affairs, Canada, in the mid and late. 1980, sure. Well, I expect your CV on my desk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely wonderful. Um, but thank you, thanks to our speakers, but thank you all for coming this evening. Um, some people sort of hear our idea and think, well, you know what, it's just never happened. Um, but they said that about the conscientious objectors 100 years ago. Mm. And the reason that they won is that people made their objection known. Now, I'd like to invite everybody in this room evening to head over there and if they feel moved to write a statement of conscience and some of the statements we've been receiving have been almost identical to ones that we found in the historical archives from World War One. Then give us your statement of conscience and let, let us keep it and let us know that we, we can have that um, as a historical record that this is still an issue for people and will continue to be in touch. And another observation I think of this night is that the majority of our MPs that came and spoke tonight are new MPs. <coughs> And I, and I think it's important that our ideas are passed on to a new generation of mm. MPs. And I'm absolutely delighted that we've had um, some of the new incumbents to carry on this idea. Uh, because as we heard this evening, people have been marching for, for 50 years, and we may be marching for another 50 years, but we've got to keep marching, ladies and gentlemen. So, so let's do it. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, there will, of course, be drinks. But before you do that, please fill in your statements. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and give us your details. If you want to help um, our campaign, we need support from people like you. 
Um, and if we'd love to hear from each and every one of you if you want to support our campaign in some way. So please get around to talk about it. Well, thank you all for coming.